Good morning. Good morning. Welcome everyone. So glad that you're here today. So glad that you braved a little bit of snow, our first snowfall of the season. Glad that you came on in and joined us here and you're connecting online. So glad that you're connecting as well. I would encourage you to leave, leave comments and we'll respond to those. It makes, it makes us all feel a little bit more connected. And for those of you who are here, and hopefully you can see this online as well too, a little decorating yesterday. Doesn't the sanctuary look fantastic? Thank you to everyone who helped. It really is. It's beautiful in here. Helps us get into the mood for, for Christmas. Let's start by going to God in prayer. Father, we, we come before you with hearts overflowing with gratitude. You are the source of every blessing in our lives. We're humbled by your love and your grace. Thank you for the countless blessings that you've poured on our lives, both big and small. Lord, we're grateful for the blessings that are not only material provisions that we need, but more so the eternal blessings of faith and hope. As we offer up our praise and thanksgiving today during the service, we pray that it's pleasing to you, Father. Bless everything that happens in this service today. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Psalm 96, starting verse 1, says, Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord and praise his name. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the peoples, his marvelous deeds among the nations. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. Yes. If you're able, please stand and let's sing praises to God together.
2 Samuel chapter 22, verses 2 through 4, it says, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock, my shield, and the horn of my salvation. Yes. He is my stronghold, my refuge, and my Savior. Let's sing about that firm foundation of God.
Joshua 21, verse 45, says, not one of all of the Lord's good promises, and there are many promises, not one of his good promises to Israel failed. Everyone was fulfilled. Our God still keeps his promises, and that will always remain. that we do not deserve. We thank you that you are the God who never fails to keep his promises, who always provides for us. And so we come, we bring our needs, our desires, our wishes, our concerns to you. We lift up all the prayer requests that are listed in our worship folder, those that are on our hearts and our minds that we haven't even spoken out loud. Pray, Father, for healing for our friends and family who have physical and mental illnesses. We pray for comfort for those who are grieving. Pray for restoration of broken relationships. Pray, Father, for revival in this land. We thank you for being the God who lifts up those who are weighed down. Our desire is to praise you as long as we live 
So we ask that you inhabit our time together today. Bless the words of the message that you've prepared today. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Welcome. It is offering time. One of the ways we worship God is through our giving. So I'm inviting the ushers to come forward and to accept our tithes and offerings. If you're a visitor, you're our guest and don't feel obligated to give. So we have an exciting December coming up. First is Crafts Day, which is December the 2nd. That's next Saturday at 10 o'clock. I'm told in some pajama read. So ladies, come in your pajamas. Bring some, what the heck? <laughs> and bring some food and let's have a good time. Uh, we will be doing crafts as well as eating and raw lounging around in pajamas. So we'll see you there. <laughs> Don't listen to Pastor, we're not having a pillow fight. <laughs> okay, the other exciting things are Sunday, December 24th, which is Christmas Eve. We will have one service in the morning, and we will have a Christmas Eve, of, that's going to be at 10 o'clock. Come at 10, don't come at 9, don't come at 11, come at 10. What time are we coming for morning service on Christmas Eve? Okay. We'll announce it again. Okay. Chris, and then Christmas Eve service will be at 9 o'clock. That's a totally different service, so we expect everybody back here Christmas Eve at 9 o'clock. Not sure I'll be coming because I probably sleep. <laughs> okay, and then Sunday, the 31st, we will have a 10 o'clock service only. That's New Year's Eve, 10 o'clock service only. Uh, next thing, next week, first Sunday, we will have hospitality table. For those of you who enjoy the coffee and cakes, in the back before service will be hospitality table. You are allowed to bring little treats. So do that. We'll see you there. And I think there's two more things. Don't forget the church food pantry. Sharon's still looking for donations so we can help other people through the holiday. And continue to check your bulletin for other ways to serve. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Betty. Psalm 116, verses 5 through 7 says, The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. The Lord protects the simple-hearted. When I was in great need, he saved me. Be at rest once more, O my soul. For the Lord has been good to you. Sing about our good, good Father.
able and willing, please stand and as we enjoy these Christmas decorations and sing a couple Christmas hymns. So you folks have defied those odds. Well done. Straight to heaven. Oh, yeah. Extra credit. Extra credit, yes. Extra credit. And yeah, that'll be on the quiz. Hey, there should be a Bible somewhere close by, in front of you there, or near you somewhere. Grab that Bible if you don't mind. And we're going to turn to the book of First Thessalonians. Chapter 1. We started just a few weeks ago a study of the book of 1 Thessalonians. 
written by the Apostle Paul. He wrote this to a church in a place called Thessalonica, and so it has the name Thessalonians. We're going to start at verse 8. Chapter 1, verse 8 of 1 Thessalonians. Yes. Yes. <laughs> if you have it, say, Jazzy Christmas. Jazzy Christmas. All right. And now the word of the Lord is ringing out from you to people everywhere, even beyond Macedonia and Achaia. For wherever we go, we find people telling us about your faith in God. We don't need to tell them about it, for they keep talking about the wonderful welcome you gave us and how you turned away from idols to serve the living and true God. And they speak of how you're looking forward to the coming of God's Son from heaven, Jesus, whom God raised from the dead. He's the one, Jesus is the one who has rescued us from the, what's that word? Terror. Terrors of the coming judgment. So, as we continue in the book of 1 Thessalonians, we have Paul uh, doing what, uh, what he does in the beginning of a lot of his letters. He gives these words of encouragement and commendation, and he's elaborating on that even further. We've already encountered these words of praise for the folks in this church, and basically, Paul is saying to them, well done. Hey, guys in Thessalonica, the church there, your faith, people are talking about, it's admirable, it's exemplary. Paul is saying to him, you guys rock. Yes. And that's unusual because rock music had just barely not even been around much. And I think Keith Richards was a teenager still at that point in time. Uh, Paul says, wherever we go, we find people telling us about your faith. That's a pretty nice compliment, isn't it? I'm going here, I'm going there. Everywhere I go, they're telling me about you guys and this faith. And again, this is not empty praise. This isn't false. Their faith was noteworthy. Now, there's a specific aspect of their faith journey that Paul mentions in verse 9, and this always catches my attention. Um, he mentions the fact that these folks in Thessalonica, and he mentions it because it just kind of gets a brief little statement, but it's actually a very big deal. They turned away from idols to serve the real God. And, and again, I, I think sometimes we kind of lose how big of a deal that is. And, and we might even be tempted to think, ah, oh, you know, idol worship. Those unsophisticated people way, way back then, they're so silly, they get caught up in all of that. But actually, idol worship is still an issue today, right? Yes. You know this, right? Yeah. Now, in fact, I'm going to come back to that a little bit later. But first, let's talk a little bit about Thessalonica and this idol worship. One of the reference works that I read this week said that the Greek word that is translated in our Bible, it's translated into turn, they turned away from this. Uh, it said in this reference book that that was a single definite act. So it's this very intentional, very specific thing. It says this church there made a deliberate choice and in like a, a sweeping decision, they turned to God and walked away from their idols. And, and in this reference book, it, it said that this would have been for them, this was more than just accepting the right doctrines. Like this was, for them, it was more than just we agree with yeah, yeah, these truths that you're telling us. It would have involved that, would have been more than that. It would have been um, embracing a way of life that involved them serving God and serving others as like a top priority of their lives. So again, this is very transformational change. This is, if you're familiar with the phrase worldview, like your worldview is, is a, a, a word that we use to like describe your whole understanding of reality, of how everything happens and works. This would have been an alteration of their worldview. There's another article that I read this week, you know, kind of looking this up and studying it, and it said that in this region that they were in, Macedonia, the Macedonian region, it was very common for people to worship the Olympian gods. You've probably heard maybe of like Zeus or Apollo or Poseidon or Aphrodite. These are the names of some of these Olympian gods. You've probably heard of them before. Uh, we hear about this like they worship Zeus or like Hercules would have been one of these uh, kind of gods. We hear people and, and we think, oh, that's just... That's just silly stuff from long ago that makes for fantasy movies today. But we need to kind of, it's helpful for us to remember, they believed this. 
This was part of their understanding. So they turned from this. I, I, I think it's, it's hard in a way to describe what a big deal this is because you gotta understand. I mean, think about it, okay, put it like this. Here comes Paul and a couple other guys. They never seen, they've never seen these guys before in their lives. These Paul and some guys come into town and they tell them about Jesus. And these guys completely embrace Jesus and turn from, the, from their understanding, their previous understanding of reality. And now that they see Jesus as God, this is very significant. This is a remarkable conversion. Like people would have been saying, hey, did you hear about what's going on in Thessalonica? Yeah, I thought they believed in this and that. And Not anymore. Wow. So they turn from their idols. I said a few moments ago, and a lot of you agreed with me, the worship of idols is still an issue today. Now we might hear that and go, ah, Dan, get out of here, nobody. And I think we can have perhaps a little misunderstanding just because of the word idol. That word, I think, can throw us off. Because if I hear somebody say idol, what first comes to my mind is like a, a little statue or something. So we hear idol worship, we think, oh, somebody's got a statue, and they put the statue up on a pedestal, and they're worshiping that statue. That could happen, but that wouldn't be likely in our culture. So think of an idol, instead of thinking of it like that, think of an idol this way. This would be a way of thinking of it in our culture, and it would be correct. An idol is anything, 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 literally anything other than God, the real true God, anything other than God that a person puts first and foremost in their life. It's first in their lives and it's not God, it's an idol. Does that make sense? Are you following that? That's an idol. So by that definition, I think it'd be fair to say there are lots of people worshiping idols today. Here, think about this. I want to press in a little bit, not to, just so that we, we see a reality here. Your family, your job, some material possession, so here, some highly desired goal that you're pursuing. Mm -hmm. If any of those things, and they might be good things actually, but if any of those things are more important to you than God, then it's an idol. And again, please understand, there's some nuance here. I'm not saying those things are bad. Your family's not bad. That's not the point I'm making. In fact, those can be very, very good things. But if they have a place in your life that's higher than God, then they're an idol and that's wrong. By the way, for uh, people who worship idols in our culture, what would be the primary thing that gets worshiped in, I, in our culture as an idol? I'll give you another one, self. I think that one even goes beyond money. Self, yeah. For many people, self is, it's the idol, it's the master. For many people, it sounds weird to say it, but for many people, the object of their greatest affection is self. Their devotion, their worship. Nobody here, or anybody watching online, probably none of us have ever even been mildly tempted to worship Zeus or Hercules. <laughs> But it's still possible we have some idols. So we're told in the text, this is so interesting to me, that they turned away, the folks in Thessalonica, they turned away from these idols. Like I said, that was a very big deal. And we're not given lots of details in the Bible text. Of, well, how did this happen? Explain this further. We know that they heard the message of Jesus. Paul tells them about Jesus. And when they heard the truth of Jesus and who he is and what he's done, they received that as truth. Imagine if some guy came into town and we never heard of Jesus before. He goes, Jesus. And they go, yes. No more with this stuff. Yes to Jesus. How does that happen? I, actually, I wish we had more details. We know that Paul comes and, 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 and he's reasoning with them and he's using persuasion and testimony. You know, the, what Jesus has done in their lives and that's good and that's important and I think that can be very powerful. But there's got to be, and, and Paul mentions this, a work of the Holy Spirit. There has to be something supernatural. You can't, after the nine o'clock service, somebody came out to me and said, 
Think of all the times you've ever tried to talk to someone about Jesus and it just went nowhere. They're like, there's got to be like a, this Holy Spirit thing. Again, we don't have the, how did this happen, details. But they came to some kind of a place where they go, this Jesus thing is true. How do you get that to happen? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit has to be at work. And we know, because Paul actually tells us in some earlier verses we already read a few weeks ago, Paul tells us that there was a powerful work of the Holy Spirit there. A couple of weeks ago we read this. This is in verse 5 of this same chapter. The Holy Spirit gave them full assurance that what Paul said about the good news was true. So, like, they hear this story about Jesus, and in their hearts it's like, this is true. There's an I'm, I'm sure of it. Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Holy Spirit work. By the way, uh, I've mentioned that the worship of idols is still an issue today. It wouldn't be the same as what they dealt with in Thessalonica, perhaps, for us, as, as, it, as it would be for us. But a second, since I'm a pastor of a church, I was thinking, well, how would we turn from our idols today? And I think... The answer would be very similar to what happened back then. There has to be some kind of a work of the Holy Spirit. And I think what, what we have to do really too is we have to understand and recognize and acknowledge that we may have some idols. Like we have to be willing to see that. Like I put it to you, just I'm trying to be helpful. Is it possible you might have an idol or some idols? Is there something in your life, like if you're just, this is just between you and God, if you're really honest about it, it's actually more important to you than God. Do you have something like that? It might be money, like a lot of people said money. That's, that's, pretty, good, uh, that's pretty good possibility in our culture. This money is hard to come by, isn't it? Anybody got a spare million you can loan me? Yeah, money. So we kind of like, it can become an idol. A career, I think, can become an idol. I think I've seen that for some people. Here, I'll give you one. You ready? Are you sitting down? I think it's very possible for a political ideology to become an idol for a person. Even if it's a true one, I think that can be an idol. An amazing house that you've always wanted. The perfect husband, the perfect wife, maybe a little of both. <laughs> In our culture, again, I think self is, for many people, I, you know what's odd? Even sometimes I think people with low self-esteem, self is still their idol. It's, it's just what they think about all the time. For some people, and this really is a message that we get in our culture too in some ways, I'm the beginning, I'm the end, I'm the arbiter of truth. Have, haven't you ever heard this phrase? Your truth. Tell me your truth. Your truth is your truth. Well, what does that mean? It means I'm the arbiter of truth. Who are you? The arbiter of truth. Oh. We just had a class, Brittany's class, that we uh, do once a month. Cultural lies is a, and biblical truths. That's the name of the class. And the topic this morning was, this is something we hear in our culture. You're enough. You are enough. Embrace you. Look deep inside you because you are enough. Biblically, that's a lie. If you're enough, why did Jesus have to come? You don't need him. You're already enough. That belief is incompatible with Christianity. I'm enough. In our culture, there are people, I think if they would be really, really honest... <laughs> They could change the lyrics. There's an old hymn that says, Great is thy faithfulness. You ever hear that one before? Many of you. Great is thy faithfulness. For some people in our culture, it could read, they could do the lyrics this way. All I have needed, my hand hath provided. Great is my faithfulness, self unto me. Ah, it's so wonderful. Sing it again. <laughs> So, to turn from our idols, we have to understand, we have to recognize the real truth about God. There's a God. There's someone higher than you. You're not enough. You need some. You, you need Jesus. 
There's someone greater than you. There's someone more important. There's actually someone who's literally more important than everything. Literally, he's more important than everything else. And it's not you. It's God. Hey, there's something in your life right now. There's something in your life that is most important to you. The question is not if. The question is just what is it? That's just a simple fact. Something is more, is of most importance to you. Have you thought about what that is? Could you tell me what it is? Like, I know some people who I know, they would say this, yeah, I know what's of most, of most importance to me, Dan. I absolutely know what it is. It's my children. That's what's of most importance to me. Then your children are idols. Mm-hmm. How dare you say that, Dan? You're a horrible person. No, I'm just trying to help you see and understand in practical ways, biblical truth. Your children are wonderful. They're a gift from God, yes? Yes. If they're more important to you than God, then that's not good. Hey, frankly, it's not good for your children if they're more important to you than God. It's not good for them. I'm just telling you the truth now. Again, I'm not saying your children are, are not a good thing. They should be a high, high, high priority in your life. But we're talking now about getting the order right here. So, so, so that we don't end up worshiping idols. Anything that's of higher importance than God, even something good and beautiful, even a gift from God, if we place that gift higher than God, then it's an idol and that's not good. Hey, my friends, we have to recognize God as most, most important. See, here's the thing. If God is in the right place in our lives, if he's first where he belongs, then all those other good things can be in their right place. Then they, they can be in their right place. If we get the fundamental reality of God, if we get that wrong, if, we, if God's place in our lives is wrong, then nothing else will ever be right. You'll be chasing and chasing, and it won't be right. We have to build our lives on the right foundation, yes? yes. <sighs> now, I feel like I'm done, but I got one more point to make. Can you handle one more point? <laughs> How are you doing? In verse 10, Paul mentions one other issue, I'll try to make this quick, that they were talking about in Thessalonica. They're looking forward to Jesus, God's Son, coming from heaven. This is obvious. This is a reference to the second coming. You've, now, everybody here, you've heard of the second coming of Jesus, right? I think probably everybody's familiar with that, yes. Uh, this is something that's going to get mentioned a number of times in the book of 1 Thessalonians. It's actually a key theme. It's meant, the second coming of Jesus is mentioned in every chapter in the book of 1 Thessalonians. Now, here's the thing. All Bible-believing Christians agree that there's going to be a second coming. You'd say to a Bible-believing Christian, is Jesus coming again? And I'll say, yes, he is, absolutely. But if you start to talk a little bit more about the details and try to get specific on the details, then you find out that there's a lot of different positions and there can be some disagreement, sometimes some even heated disagreement about this topic. And so I want to say to you, as we go along through 1 Thessalonians, I'm going to try to explain the different positions that people may hold as they apply to different verses that we encounter. But I want to say this, for a long, long time around here, we have held the position that these end times issues are things that we can agree to disagree about. I hope you will hold that position with me. In other words, we do not believe, and, and I hope you can do this, that these different views that people may hold regarding this up and coming, we don't think these are things over which we need to break fellowship. Yes? Yeah, yeah let's do it. Thank you. Three people are clapping. So let's <laughs> Everybody's going to clap. One, two, three. Yes? Yeah, good. Hey, we can be brothers and sisters in Christ, authentic brothers who love each other and worship and fellowship together, and we can hold different views regarding eschatology. Eschatology is the fancy word for the study of end time. That sounds fair, yes? We're going to do that. We're going to give each other some room. We're going to be gracious and loving. Um, but let me say this, just sort of in regards to that verse 10. Jesus is coming. Yes. 
There's disagreement over how it's going to happen, but he's, you know this, right? Also, Paul makes a reference, when he talks about the second coming in verse 10, he makes a reference to the judgment. A time will come when there will be a judgment of every single person. You will stand before the judgment seat of God. Well, me and my bodies are going to... No, 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 no. You'll be by yourself. I will too. It kind of sounds a little intimidating, doesn't it? Yeah. A little bit. I want to ask you something because this is so important and it's a reality. Are you in a good place right now? Like if you had to stand before God's judgment seat later today, are you in a good place right now for that? In verse 10, and by the way, this is definitely part of the good news. This is good news. At the end of verse 10, Jesus says, or Paul says this about Jesus. He, Jesus, he, this is what it says in the text. He's the one who rescued us from the terrors. That's the word that it uses. The terrors of the coming judgment. I'm a rescued one. Are you? Oh, yeah. yeah, we want to be rescued ones, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Terror, the terror of the judgment. Can I maybe be rescued? Jesus. Yeah. It's always the answer. What should we do, Dan? Turn to Jesus. Well, this is happening in the world, and that's happening in the world. Turn to Jesus. Yes? Yeah. I'm going to ask if you would stand, please. And uh, we're going to sing just a little portion. Of, I'm, I'm already in this Christmas mood. Is our, our uh, is Rita the, oh, Rita, okay, good. I can't get the, I can't get the, this one right, even though I love this hymn, I'm such a terrible singer. Sing it. Do me a favor, sing it again, sing it again. afterwards and she would love to pray with you uh, Jesus loves you he's our rescuer yes? yes thank you Lord bow your heads if you would please Lord Jesus we love you thank you for your goodness your grace I think I hope I pray all of us and the folks who are watching online I'm praying all of us know you and uh, we're going to stand before that throne of judgment, righteous and holy. Yes. <laughs> Believe it or not, because of you, Lord Jesus. So thank you. Thank you for your goodness. Help us, Lord, to turn from those things that keep us distant from you. I think sometimes some of us have this hesitation. I just sense that we have this hesitation to really be full in for you. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would do a work in our lives and that that hesitation would be gone. Knock it down. Let us be fully devoted to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Amen. God bless. Have a pickerty third kind of day. Thank you. Thank you.